Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, I love Sundays. I love coming to this church, but especially young adult Sundays fill me up. And one of the reasons is the inspiration, the energy, the life in these amazing people just, it shines out. And who doesn't get caught up in that? So what a blessing to be a part of their lives and what a blessing to be able to lead worship today. Um, we are just so excited to lead you in worship. Some of the songs are just so amazing. The first one we're going to sing is called Glorious Day, and it is, I was lost without you, Lord. I was dead. I was in the grave till you called my name, and I ran out of that grave to your glorious day. So that's going to be one of the things we're rejoicing over today. So another favorite, I have a lot of favorite parts of service, don't I, um, is passing of the peace. This is where we get to reach out, touch each other, and share God's love. So stand up, take a minute, and greet your neighbor. This next song that we're going to be singing is one that was introduced to you a couple weeks ago. Um, it's called Build My Life. And the bridge in this song, it says, I will build my life upon your love, a firm foundation. And that's something we're taught always, right, from the time we were in children's church to now, to build your life upon God's love because it's never failing, right? The grass will wither, flowers will fall, but your love and your words are going to stand forever. And once we build that foundation, it's so hard to live on it and to stay there. I find myself a lot recently in the past few months just stepping off of that foundation and living my own life, doing my own thing and not abiding on that foundation. And so when we're singing the song, I want you guys to be thinking like, I wanna stay on that foundation of your love. I wanna be reminded of your love day in and day out. Just make that your prayer through the song. If you guys want, you can stand and worship with us, please. Good morning. Good morning. Listen, that is hard, all right? That was awesome. And I can dance and that was hard for me, so. <laughs> Uh, my name is Alark Allen. You can call me Al, like the song. And um, I'm here representing the young adults on Young Adult Sunday. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that I'm African American. Please hold your applause. Um, and uh, I was raised in the African American church, and we went to church on Sunday, and we didn't get out till Monday afternoon. If you go to African American church, bring a sack lunch, you're going to be there all day. That's all I'm saying. And it's one of the reasons I actually converted to being a Methodist, because our services are 53 minutes and we're off to brunch. So I want to honor that today. And I have this outline of thanking all these different people. I'm just not going to have time. So you know who you are. I love you. Thank you. I wouldn't be up here if it wasn't for you. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today, fighting for the hearts of your people. You're an amazing God, and you're worthy of our love. It's not a matter of doing, but a matter of seeing. And we can somehow see how amazing your love is, then we can be a people filled to the fullness of your measure. And that happens in this church, can turn this world upside down. When Elijah prayed, you answered his prayer by sending fire from heaven. So we pray that today. Father, light it up. Amen. Amen. All right. So I have a really serious question to ask, and it's going to take a lot of courage on your part to answer it. And I really want everyone to try to dig down deep and find that courage. And if the answer is yes, then please raise your hand. Have you ever watched Seinfeld? There we go. Don't be ashamed. There we go. Roll it. So I'm on Third Avenue, minding my own business, and yada, yada, yada. I get a free massage and a facial. What a succinct story. <laughs> I'm surprised you drive a Cadillac. Oh, it's not mine. It's my mother's. Are you close with your parents? Well, they gave birth to me and yada, yada. Yada what? Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> All right, so... So for me to tell this story, you have to know Seinfeld terminology. So about seven months ago, my wife went out of town and I have two sons, one's Jacob, he's 20, he's in Tallahassee, and my son, 13, is Seth, he's 13, and he's a travel basketball player. So he had tournaments all over the city, and so something happened at one of the games that caused me a lot of shame. So here I am, drowning in shame all day long, driving him all over the city. I come home, he goes to the movie with his friends, I'm at home by myself, Saturday night, wife's gone, kids are gone, how many opportunities am I going to have like this on a Saturday night, right? Get on the phone, start texting my friends, yada, yada, yada. She comes back early the next day, and she is upset. 
And so I go through this shame cycle. At first, you know, I'm like making excuses, like yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. It's not that big of a deal. And when that doesn't work, you know, I'm getting mad at her and blaming her. And when that doesn't work, I'm pouting. And when that doesn't work, I'm like shaming her about things that have nothing to do with what we're talking about. I'm like, that's why your side of the room is never clean. You know, and so this keeps happening on and on over and over again. And so at some point she brings you to this book and uh, she says, you need to read this. You know, if you're in a Christian marriage, guys, you know your wife, and she brings you a Christian book, something's gonna be in there about how you need to love her like Christ loves the church, right? It happens all the time. So the fact is I kind of pretended to read it and I gave it back to her. It's like, no, that didn't help. So the shame cycle continues, and pretty soon the shame cycle is worse than the actual yada yada. And, you know, I, this continues. And so at this point, I wanted to try to figure out where my son was all this. And I went and talked to him, and he told me something, and it wasn't really bad. He probably doesn't remember, but it was like someone shot me in the chest with a shotgun. And it produced a pain in me that I'd never felt before. And it just stayed with me for about three days. And at some point, at the third day, I was willing to do anything to get this pain out of my chest. And so I was Googling everything I possibly could. And I found this TED Talk by Brene Brown about shame. And it was 18 minutes, and I listened to it, and I listened to it again, and I listened to it again, and it made me feel better. And so I came home, and I told my wife about it, and she brought that book out and said, guess who wrote the book? Brene Brown. God's prevenient grace, right? So I read that book in two days, and I sat my family down. It absolutely healed me. I sat my family down, and I said, you know what? I'm imperfect. I'm going to make mistakes, um, and I'm sorry for that. But, you know, God's forgiven me. He's going to redeem this. He's going to turn this into something beautiful and amazing that displays his glory. The story of our family is not over that. And since then, it seems like God has been blessing our family with all types of things. One of the things that Brene does, one of the things I've been practicing that she teaches is shame resilience. And there are five steps. One is to own your shame, to own it. The second step is to tell the truth about it, tell the consequences, whatever they are. Usually they're not as bad as what you think they are. The third is to be self-compassionate, is to tell yourself, talk to yourself like you would be talking to somebody else in that situation. The fourth is gratitude. Be grateful for the things that didn't happen. Be grateful for the things that you're actually going to learn from it. And the fifth because shame can't live in secrecy. When I read these steps, I was like, Jesus wrote these. These are biblical concepts, right? First one is to confess your sins. Um, confession. First John 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The second one is um, seek the truth. Seek the truth, John 8, 32. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The third one is um, self-compassion. What's more compassionate than having a God who forgives you? I, I justify grace. Isaiah 1, 18. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Be grateful for the ways that God pursues you in your shame, for being at grace, to be grateful for what he does to justify you, to protect you from his consequences, which is justified faith. And sanctified faith is to take that whatever that is, and to turn into something beautiful and amazing and incredible that displays his glory. We see that happen often in the Bible, where there's David and Bathsheba, and David kills Bathsheba's husband, and all of a sudden that, that son that's produced from that union becomes Solomon, he becomes the wisest and richest king that's ever lived. Or we see it with Paul, who kills Stephen, a missionary, and Paul all of a sudden becomes the greatest missionary that's ever lived. We see that all the time where God takes these broken things and makes it amazing, turn it into something beautiful that displays his glory. And then when that happens, all you can feel is gratitude and love for God. And so you go and you give a testimony. And so since I've been practicing these things, I want to tell you about some of the things that's been happening in my life. First thing is I stopped doing stupid stuff. Now I want to clarify, I didn't stop being stupid. <laughs> I probably got more stupid, but I stopped doing stupid stuff. I figured that my entire life I had been worshiping shame. And so when God introduced to me 
the biblical way of fighting shame. I didn't need to do those stupid things anymore. Second thing is joy increased. Brene says this thing that if you, the feelings you don't want to feel, you know, we, we focus on the feelings we don't want to feel, but that causes us not to feel the good feelings we do want to feel. And so I felt the bad feelings. I said four words to my wife that I'd never said before in our entire life a couple of months ago. You hurt my feelings. And she's like, I didn't know I could hurt your feelings. Like, I didn't know either. But apparently my feelings could have been hurt for 14 years. But joy has increased, and there's sometimes, not all the time, that I have so much joy that I have to ask God to stop. I'm on the treadmill, and tears are streaming down my eyes. I'm like, God, please, let's just wait till we get to the car. They're going to kick me out of the gym. They're going to think that I'm crazy. Another thing that happened is that I instantly became one of the best husbands in the world. Literally, I promise you that happened. Um, and it's not because I showered more or I had, you know, came up with different moves. It's because of the fact that it was easier for me to apologize because being imperfect didn't bring shame. And I got so good at this that I would be at work and God would bring me things that I did years ago. And I would come home and I would print about it. I'd be like, you know, I'd come home and say, sweetie, remember in 2006 when, um, you know, we had to get that work Christmas party and yada, 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 we couldn't go? I'm sorry about that. But I'm forgiven. God's going to redeem it. He's going to turn something beautiful and amazing that displays his glory, the story that sends on over the earth. Remember that time I called your sister a fascist in front of your entire family? My bad. <laughs> but you know what? I'm forgiven. God's going to forgive it. He's going to redeem this. He's going to turn this something beautiful and amazing that displays his glory, a story that sends on over the earth. Remember that time we were flipping a mattress and it landed you in the emergency room? I probably take some responsibility for that. I apologize. God's forgiven me. He's going to, yeah, by the way, there's no yada yada to that story. We're actually flipping a mattress on New Year's Eve. I still don't know why. It caused an argument. We had this low hanging ceiling fan on. We had to bend the mattress over. So I'm holding one end. She goes to the other end. And we're having an argument. And she's continuing the argument. She's like, let it go. I was like, no, sweetie, I can't let it go. It's going to ricochet and hit you in the face. And she's like, no, it's not. Let it go. And I was being a good husband. I would have said, you're probably right, but just let's do this my way just this once. But I wasn't being a good husband, so I let it go. And she's right. It didn't hit her in the face. It hit her in the chest and gave her a slight concussion, which is the worst emergency room visit ever because everyone thinks that I abused her. <laughs> Security officers look at me like I'm O.J. Simpson. Nurses rolling their eyes at me when I came in. And I really hope the end of that story is not over yet. The biggest thing that's happened to me is that I begin to fall in love with God. Oh God. The Lord, O oh God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. All right, this is what's, I uh, was the other one. Oh, me, okay. <laughs> Luke 10, 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Good. What's amazing about these verses is that God gave Israelites 614 laws. And the, if they're saying the whole secret to being righteous, to being holy, to pleasing God, to doing everything that he requires us to do is loving him with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls and all of our strength. When I discovered this 10 years ago, I was like, this is a code. It's the matrix. And I solved it. It's like a Rubik's Cube. I solved it. What this actually means is like secret language. He's saying loving God with your heart is pursuing your destiny. Loving God with all your mind is reading the Bible. Loving God with all your soul is, 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 read, is, is singing. And, and loving God with all your strength is getting it done, tangible results. I created flowcharts. True, right? Workbook. <laughs> and it never made me more obedient. It never made me closer to God. And it just dawns on me, what if God's saying to take ultimate pleasure in him? What if he's saying through these verses to fall madly and obsessively in love with him? What if he's saying to be consumed with him, to want him with every ounce of our being? How do we do that? How do you make yourself fall in love with someone? I read the Bible a ton, and there's only one verse I've ever read 
that actually says how to fall in love with God. Luke. I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom the little is forgiven loves little. So here that, did, you, did everyone hear that? Did everyone? So here, this, this passage in this really scandalous story, you have this prostitute, and she's a good prostitute. She has enough money, $30,000, to buy this alabaster jar of perfume. Um, and there's some type of prevenient grace going on. She has this encounter with God. I love the fact that God, the Bible never says what happened, but she has this encounter with God, and it makes her buy this jar of perfume and go seek Jesus out. And we see justified grace here because as soon as she walks into that house, the Pharisees should have killed her. By the law of Moses, they should have killed her, but she knew that God was going to protect her. And she goes up to him and he should have rejected her. I mean, all life, my whole entire life, we're taught that God rejects sinners. Here she is a sinner, and God did not reject her. And then she takes this perfume that's bought with fornication and adultery and lust and covenant breaking. This is a dirty gift because it's brought with dirty money. And she takes it, and she pours it on Jesus' feet, and she pours it on his head. And he receives it. This is scandalous. I mean, if you heard Jesus and it, preaching later on in that week, he would smell like his fragrance. If you, if you saw the prostitutes somewhere in the marketplace, she would smell like that. And so if you knew that they both smelled the same way, you would only have one conclusion, that Jesus was sleeping with a prostitute. That's a hypocrite, and he's a liar. This is scandalous. And when you prove it, guys, tomorrow morning, go buy some women's perfume, spray it all over you, and then go home and hug your wife. <laughs> and when she asks you why you smell like that, Tell her that story. It's scandalous. And so we see this example as sanctified grace. Because what God says to her, he says, you know what? Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And he's not talking about heaven and hell. He's talking about her life. He was saying that your story isn't over yet. Because he knows that he's going to be anointed a week before he dies with the same bottle of perfume. That when he's at the Last Supper, he's going to have the same fragrance that the fragrance that the prostitute just anointed him with. That means that communion, for now on, the disciples, when they talk about Jesus, and they talk about him washing their feet and the way, they, way he smelled, it is going to be this fragrance. That when he gets arrested, he's, he smells like this fragrance. When he's before the Sanhedrin, and he's getting beaten and mocked and spit on, he smells like this fragrance. When he's with the Romans, they stripped his clothes off and they're flogging him and they put a crown of thorns in his head. He smells like this fragrance. When he's marching up the hill towards his death, he smells like this fragrance. When they're crucifying him, he smells like this fragrance. When he's up there on that cross suffocating and God is placing all sins on him and striking him down, he smells like this fragrance. And if that woman was in the crowd watching Jesus die, how could she not take pleasure in him? How could she not fall obsessively, madly in love with him? How could she not want him with every ounce of her being? Because she, Jesus took her broken, sinful gift, her gift that represented sin and adultery and lust, and turned it into the fragrance of God dying to save his people turned something horrible and redeemed it and made it beautiful and amazing and displayed his glory. You better believe our story wasn't over yet. So that's what's been happening to me over the last seven months, that God has been giving me examples of sanctifying grace, um, and I would be here for two days telling you all of the ones they are, but I'm going to give you one, and that's this church, the Isle of Faith. So I, seven years ago, we moved down here, and um, I was coming here steeped in failure and shame. And it's obviously that God wanted me to come to this church to receive some of the gifts for my restoration. And I, uh, I had to take my wife to work, and I had to take my sons to school, and so that means I, I, we were there over the bridge on the beach. So that means I had to pass this church a thousand times, three times a day for a year, which is a thousand times. Not one time did I think about coming in here. Not one time did I think about stopping. 
We went to three churches during that time, and every single one of them trashed my wife's gift and her calling as a worship leader. And so if I was fighting for her destiny, I would have driven to every single church in this city trying to find a place that would treasure my wife's calling. And God would have been in heaven going, yes! That's what it takes to be a man. That's what it takes to be a husband. Way to love your wife like Christ loves the church. By the way, that place that you're looking for, you pass it three times a day. But I said, I'm not going to do it. Nope, not going to do it. So I'm starting off, by the way, that's a thousand sins right out the top. Right? I want to make that clear. It's a thousand sins right at the top. So God's like, you know what? I'm going to help this guy out. There's a job opening here. And I interview for it. And I kill it in the first interview. Right? And I go to the second interview, and I'm killing in the second interview. And then someone asks the question, what's your favorite Christian artist? And I don't listen to Christian music, so I save Dave Matthews. <laughs> I mean, I could have said, I could have made up something. I could have said Ephesians 5. You know, I could have made up anything. If I say Dave Matthews, yada, 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 nobody calls me back. So I don't, that doesn't ring any alarm bells in my head. So I keep going. So God's like, you know what? I'm going to make him go here. And my wife was hired, and I spent the whole time trying to reject every single thing this place could give me. Then something amazing happened a couple, about a year ago. Sorry, I know you told me not to do that. Um, Will became the pastor here, and Carol became the lay leader. And they began to fight for my wife and love her and protect her, and it transformed her and made her a different woman and a different mother and a different wife. And I was reaping the benefits in my household because of the love that they shared for them. For some unknown reason, six months ago, Mike and Anella Oates and Brenda invited me, and her husband invited me and my wife to brunch. And I'm like, oh, great brunch with Methodists. And it was the greatest time I've ever had. I've been praying for social connection like that forever. It was authentic. They loved me. It was amazing. It was incredible. And I'm thinking, all oh, this is interesting. And then we went to the young adults meeting, and the young adults prayed for my son Seth. They laid hands on him, and they prayed for him. I mean, my son Jacob, before he went off to Tallahassee, and he wept and he cried, and it was the first time I ever heard him corporally pray. And at that point, I'm like, I am in. I told Brenda I'll be here every Sunday. I'll be every, here every Wednesday. And then Emmaus. Emmaus. I can't talk about it, but <laughs> this is what I'll say, is that my sponsor, uh, Ray Hughes, picked me up and yada, yada, yada. I cried so much, it put me in menopause. Um, I fell in love with God, fell in love with being a Methodist, and I fell in love with this church. Now, here's the horrible thing about this, is that I could have gone to Emmaus seven years ago. Can you imagine if I had the revelations I had for seven years? I don't know what. I could be president of the United States right now. <laughs> I could have had Mike and Anella and Brenda's love seven years ago. I counted it. That's over 60 brunches that I missed. <laughs> I wouldn't have any yada yada stories if I had that. I could have, you know, Rob Johnson, I'm praying for Covenant Brothers, and Rob Johnson was perfect. My, when he left, my wife cried of him for days. I'm like, you know what? I get it. That's the only guy you're allowed to cry over. <laughs> I could have had his love for seven years, and I blew it. I'm almost done. Right. Oh, sorry. Cold off. <laughs> um, and so I want to mourn. It makes me want to be sad, all the things that I missed out on. And it also makes me want to laugh, because it, I don't think it's funny how stupid I was. But God won't let me. He shows me I'm forgiven. And he shows me that I still went to Emmaus and it still transformed my life. That I still have Mike and Nella and Brenda's love. That I'm here right now. God's even given me covenant brothers. I got my brother Tim here. And I met a guy at Emmaus who, um, who I noticed who looks like me. He's athletic looking and he's bald. The only difference is he's short and white. <laughs> my nickname for him is my Caucasian mini-me. And we're texting each other back and forth, and we're loving on each other, and he's texting me stuff that's absolutely been transforming for my life. And I'm here with you guys. I think that uh, Brene said something about being worthy of truly belonging. And I never understood what that meant until I came in here last Sunday wearing this necklace. It's the first place, first church, I feel like from that experience I truly belong to. And I'm here talking to you 
about the gospel, about grace. It would be a really boring speech if I came up here and told you, this is what I got for being obedient for seven years. I get to tell you, this is what I got despite my disobedience. And if I can't feel guilt, and if I can't feel shame, then all I can feel is gratitude that I have a creator that pursues me in spite of me. And that makes me want to take pleasure in him. That makes me want to love him. That makes me want to be consumed with him. That makes me want to want him with every ounce of my being. Because I have a God that's madly crazy in love with me, who's redeemed me and forgiven me, and taking my life and transforming it into something beautiful and amazing and incredible that displays his glory. Light up! You better believe my story isn't over yet. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for the people here. I thank you that every single person here is a child of yours, a son and daughter. You have a destiny for them that is beyond their imagination. But our first destiny, our last destiny, is to be with you forever, to be filled with your glory. For us to be able to be who we are, we must first love you. And to first love you, we have to understand that through our brokenness that you're there pursuing us and sanctifying us and justifying us. I pray for the wisdom and the knowledge and the courage for all of us to go to this place to see how you have loved us, how you have sanctified us, how you've taken those things and you turned them around and made them beautiful and amazing, incredible, and how they've displayed your glory. I pray that we know that our story is not over yet. It's your name we pray. Amen.